in accordance with the customs of this university, I open the ceremony with the following words. Spiritus Sancti Gratia Illuminat Sensus E Corda Nostra. Please be seated. It's my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to the uh, promotion ceremony of Mr. Fadel Muhammad Garisha. My name is uh, René Windels. I'm Emeritus Professor in Physiology, and I uh, replace the uh, Director Professor van Krieke today. And it's my job, really, to, uh, to make sure that the ceremony runs smoothly and that, the, uh, that I can distribute it, the time evenly between uh, the six opponents today. I also would like to make a very special welcome to our guest from Indonesia. You traveled from far to witness this uh, ceremony, which is very special. And I also would like to welcome the people who are joining this ceremony via the live stream. It is great that you all are here today. And by being present, I must say that you, first of all, underline the importance of the topic studied in the thesis but also that you show your interest in our PhD candidate. I now give the floor to the candidate for the degree of doctor. <clears throat> With the permission of the doctorate board and in order to obtain the degree of doctor from the Radboud University in Nijmegen, I would like to defend in public my doctoral dissertation entitled Novel Insights into the Pathophysiology of Dengue and COVID-19, the Role of the Immune Response platelets, and the endothelium. Dengue is the most important arboviral infections worldwide and a leading cause of acute febrile illness hospitalization in Indonesia. Dengue is caused by dengue virus, uh, serotype 1 to 4, which is a single-stranded RNA virus from the family of Flaviviridae. Dengue infection is transmitted by the Aedes mosquito, which are Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. Most of dengue cases, 50 to 60 percent, are asymptomatic infections, with 20 to 40 percent symptomatic cases, of which 2 to 5 percent develop severe complications. To date, close monitoring and adequate fluid therapy is the currently available treatment for dengue. The clinical course of dengue consists of febrile, critical, and recovery or convalescent phase. During a critical phase, there is a drop of fever. However, platelet number also rapidly dropped. And in this critical phase, shock syndrome, bleeding, and organ impairment often occurs in a subset of dengue patients. The major complications of dengue are severe plasma leakage, which leads to shock syndrome, bleeding, as well as organ impairment. An exaggerated inflammation is thought to play a role in the pathogenesis of these complications. Platelets have been known for their role in hemostasis, preservation of vascular integrity, and more recently demonstrated to have immunomodulatory properties. In dengue, for instance, activated platelets play a role in the development of pathogenesis through the interaction with inflammation and endothelium. In this thesis, new insights into the pathophysiology of dengue are presented, focusing on the crossroad between inflammation, hibernase activity, and neutrophil extracellular trap formation in dengue patients. First, we explore a comprehensive assessment of the inflammatory response in dengue patients. In chapter two, to comprehensively understand the immunopathogenesis of dengue, we measured 368 inflammatory proteomes in the acute and convalescent <coughs> phase of dengue patients. We showed a comprehensive assessment of the inflammatory pathways involved in dengue. 
the most pronounced inflammatory proteins had strong representation of interferon-mediated pathways, cytokines, and endothelial markers. We also show that newly identified proteins and a large number of associations between the inflammatory proteins with Syndegan 1 suggest that the inflammatory environment contributes to the glycocalyx dysfunction in dengue. Next, we explore the role of heparinase activity in dengue patients. The endothelium lining is covered uh, with a layer of sugar known as glycocalyx. This sugar layer regulates the blood vessel permeability as well as providing negative charge to prevent protein leakage. Heparinase is the only known enzyme which is able to degrade this sugar layer. In chapter 4, we measure the activity of plasma heparinase and endothelial glycocalyx degradation markers in the acute and convalescent phase of dengue. Plasma heparinase activity is increased during the acute phase of dengue. We also found that the increased plasma heparinase activity is associated with the markers of glycocalyx degradation and the severity of the plasma leakage in dengue patients. We further demonstrated that thrombin and dengue virus activated platelets are the possible major source of this circulating heparinase in dengue patients. Next, we explore, explore the role of the neutrophil extracellular trap formation in dengue. Neutrophils are the first line responder cells infiltrating to the infection site with the two main functions phagocytosis and degranulation. In the early 2000s, a novel effector function of neutrophil, which is known as the neutrophil extracellular trap formation or NETs, are described. NETs are web like chromatin decorated with antimicrobial peptides with a primary function to capture immobilize and kill pathogens within the host. There are two types of neutrophil extracellular trap formation. Through the NADPH oxidase or the NOx dependent pathways or the NOx independent pathways. In the latter, activated platelets play an important role through a direct or indirect interaction with the neutrophils. In chapter three, we found that the circulating nets in dengue patients were predominantly NOx independently derived nets. Nets are also strongly associated with the markers of platelet activation, endothelial glycocalyx degradation, and plasma leakage. Ex vivo, we showed that activated platelets in dengue virus NS1 induces NOx independent net formation. Nets are linked to the pathogenesis of plasma leakage in dengue patients. From COVID-19, we learned about the host directed immunotherapy and it will be interesting to also be implemented in dengue. For instance, modulation of host inflammatory response in the acute phase in a subset of dengue patients who develop severe complications, such as hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis phenotype, can be targeted with inhibition of IL-1 pathway as currently ongoing in Vietnam. Other than that, inhibition of heparinase might be an attractive host-directed therapy to prevent an excessive plasma leakage. During my PhD, another virus takes lead as the cause of hospitalization in Indonesia. SARS-CoV-2, which is a single-stranded RNA virus from the family of coronaviridae, identified as the etiology of COVID-19. From March 2020 up to now, it had resulted in almost 7 million infections with 160,000 deaths. Similar to dengue, only 2 to 5% of these COVID-19 patients develop severe complications, 
encompassing severe respiratory distress syndrome or with thrombotic complications. Platelets are dysfunctional in dengue, and although has prognostic value, measuring platelet function is technically not easy. And our collaborators have developed a new technique to measure the metabolic status of platelets. We plan to measure the platelet function in dengue patients, but due to the COVID-19 pandemics, we have to redirect our study. In chapter six, using a time-dependent ATP release response of platelets, we showed that platelets of COVID-19 patients are hyper-responsive with a reduced ATP release capacity. We also show that the platelet dysregulation in COVID-19 patients is associated with clinical severity and mortality. An ongoing study in dengue is currently performed in Bandung, Indonesia. In summary, a, a dysregulated inflammatory response and excessive release of hepernase and as well as the neutrophil extracellular trap formation are likely to play a role in the pathophysiology of dengue. These processes may be possible targets for adjunctive therapy in complicated or severe dengue, for example, through inhibition of hepernase. Lastly, a rapid and accessible platelet function assay may provide useful information on the prognosis. Having presented the summary of doctoral dissertation, I return the floor to the director. You have presented a well-illustrated and uh, understandable summary of your thesis. Thank you for this. I will now introduce the members, the experts, who are sitting in front of you. First of all, on my left, the three members of the supervision committee. First of all, Professor van der Ven, promoter and also emeritus professor of international health at our university. Next to him, Professor Hussein Kassem, also promoter. Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Deponegoro in Indonesia, and he's also director of the Center for Tropical and Infectious Diseases. And finally, Dr. De Mast, co-promoter, and he's clinician in internal medicine with a special interest in tropical infectious diseases at Rabat UMC. These three <laughs> colleagues have supervised the PhD candidates intensely, and have already spoken frequently about uh, his scientific work. And therefore, they will not participate in the scientific discussions today. Besides his supervision team, I would like to introduce the manuscript committee. And the manuscript committee uh, consists of three members who examined the thesis in detail at an earlier stage and have given their opinion. The committee consists of Professor Pickers, Le Faber, who is unfortunately not present today, and Dr. Nelwan. I will introduce the other members of the opposition later. Now I give the floor to Professor Pickers. He is Professor of Experimental Intensive Care Medicine at our university, and he's the chair of the manuscript committee. The word is yours. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Dear candidate, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate you with uh, the completion of your thesis and a very nice booklet and a very nice summary indeed as well. Uh, but as you know, it's my job, and I'm uh, paid here uh, today to uh, ask uh, very difficult questions and see if you really know what you're talking about. Uh, I also want to uh, congratulate your supervising team uh, for the completion of this. So I wanna start with uh, the beginning. And so uh, chapter two, the first uh, data chapter. Uh, and I have a couple of questions. Uh, this is a very nice, uh, comprehensive chapter on the immune response in dengue patients, but I think even more would be in it. Uh, and for example, you describe on uh, page uh, 38 that uh, many of these patients were part of uh, a randomized controlled trial in which uh, some of these patients received uh, oseltamivir, an antiviral drug. Uh, and you described that the first sample was taken prior to this intervention. I think 
it would be really interesting to also be able to show what the immune modulating effects of this intervention would have been. So if you have the patients there uh, and you, have, you can sample them, why did you not also sample them following the treatment intervention to see if this antiviral treatment had any immune modulating effects? That's my first question. Uh, dear opponent, uh, so indeed, it is true that uh, in this study, uh, we analyzed the sample uh, from a trial uh, in which most of the samples uh, where we measure the proteomic, uh, the inflammation-related uh, proteomes were prior to the treatment. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, our intention was to explore uh, with, the, with, the, with the mechanisms involved in the pathogenesis of dengue. Because as long as what we know that uh, uh, many studies have measured uh, the inflammatory proteomes uh, in dengue patients, but they use a relatively uh, number of markers, uh, a relatively minor number of markers, and using this uh, uh, extensive uh, assay, we can measure quite a large number. And in response to the question that uh, why we don't measure the post-treatment uh, was first because we want to explore uh, the mechanisms uh, involved when we uh, do not expose uh, dengue patients with certain medications. No, I, I understand that, that you mm -hmm. want to see what the disease itself is mm -hmm. doing. But do you have to sample following the treatment? Uh, we do still keep uh, All right. so some that, of the samples. That would samples. be very nice, of course, to see if yeah. there's a specific treatment effect uh, on the immunity as well. To, yeah. to, so this is still possible, and you can do that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah uh, indeed, uh, there were some references also about uh, the immune modulating uh, effects of the oseltamivir uh, in, in, in influenza patients, for instance. And um, that will be a next interesting uh, study to explore also maybe the effect of uh, the oseltamivir. Although we also in that study we measured uh, the, the effect of oseltamivir to Sindekan 1, but uh, that will be a nice suggestion right. for the next uh, the, then exploration. My, my second question is, as you alluded to also in your conclusions, that you mm -hmm. see all these uh, immune activation and uh, multiple proteins being up or down regulated, and this might give you a clue for any immune modulatory treatment, right? So my question is actually, because we know all of these immune responses have their own kinetics. Something happens and something goes down again. So it's really relevant, the timing. Where are you in the disease? So my question to you is, you described that a sample was taken in the acute phase, but what is TS0? How can you align these patients and knowing, for example, interferon goes up early and then later IL-10 or something, or is it just a mix when they came in? Or do you, did you correct for the moment of first symptoms? <clears throat> yeah. So uh, in this study, that uh, the relation with uh, the timing uh, and also which, which certain pathway that we have to target is first uh, that we know uh, that uh, the limitation of, of, of this study is indeed uh, the timing of the sample in which uh, we have a range of day uh, where people uh, develop uh, the fever and where the samples were taken. Uh, and in response to the, to the relation with uh, uh, the pattern, uh, indeed, uh, I would suggest that uh, we We've, uh, we characterize the phenotype of the patients because, for instance, uh, what, what has been shown in previous study that uh, the severe dengue patients, uh, they exhibit a more uh, hyperinflammation, but uh, with a reduce uh, of the interferon-related uh, pathway. So what, uh, what, the, what the previous study also showed that uh, the, the infer interferon response of the severe dengue patients uh, wasn't uh, being upregulated in a, in, a, in a good directions. So then they develop this hyperinflammation. And uh, a recent uh, trial is uh, currently undergone uh, in Vietnam. Uh, they were uh, relating uh, the, the occurrence of a phenotype of uh, the HLH, the hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis uh, in, 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 the, in the severe dengue patients. They also show the high ferritin and uh, in that part, uh, they uh, inhibit the IL-1 uh, pathway, for instance. But, but what I mean also is, can you give some 
indication of the kinetics that, for example, if a patient, if you say the moment that the fever develops is T0, and some patients come in early, and these patients predominantly have a higher interferon or pro-inflammatory response, and some patients come in later, and in these patients, the IL-10 or the more compensatory effects are more pronounced. Do you have any indication that the kinetics are of relevance? Yeah. Uh, so indeed, uh, what what uh, we see in the subset of these patients that we analyze, uh, we do see a trend of uh, increased interferon, and it fits with uh, with the phenotype of this patient in which they have uh, non-severe dengue. And indeed, it is true that that might be uh, the difficult part uh, to bridge to the clinic because, uh, of course, uh, the ideal is to measure uh, these markers uh, in a serial, especially during the acute phase. And then from there, we can see uh, the kinetic, for instance, in a subset of patients that develop, uh, like uh, uh, that have, re have a reduced uh, interferon response, then that's uh, the one that we might uh, target for uh, the host modulation therapy. Right. Do we have time for a short? Uh, is it okay to put it on the reserve list? <laughs> Okay. I believe the next opponent will also okay. address it, so perfect. Th thank, thank you, you very so much. Thank you for your contribution. Then we will move on to the other member of the manuscript committee, which, which is Dr. Nelwan. She is associate professor in internal medicine and tropical infectious diseases at the University of Indonesia in Jakarta. Welcome in the Netherlands. I'm very pleased that you traveled here to participate in the opposition, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Rector. First of all, I would like also to congratulate Dr. Fadel for uh, this impressive work and also the supervisors. Uh, yeah, I fly from away, so I also need to post maybe more difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, as Dr. Fadel know that uh, in managing patients with dengue, we always try to prevent the potential severity happen because this is like a continuum process so patient can come in a not severe uh, condition and then become a severe condition. Uh, in the new insight of the pathophysiology that you learn here, I am not really seeing that you do the subclassification or grouping between the uh, secondary or primary infection of dengue and do you think it's still relevant to, to analyze in different kind of group? You only uh, mentioned about the severity or not severity cases. Can you elaborate more about that? Thank you. Uh, dear opponent, so indeed uh, in most of the studies, uh, we don't uh, really uh, segregate uh, the patients based on their severity. Uh, but for instance, uh, in our uh, proteomic analysis, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the analysis part, uh, we actually did uh, a small analysis to see the difference uh, of, the, uh, of the inflammatory response uh, between uh, those with the primary or with the secondary dengue. And what we see is that uh, in, the, in the secondary dengue, uh, during the acute phase, uh, we already see the activation of uh, the adaptive immune response, so it's more uh, the T cell and uh, also B cell response. In comparison to the primary dengue in which uh, the innate immune response is, is much more uh, pronounced. Uh, and then uh, what also with, uh, with, uh, with the neutrophil uh, extracellular traps and also with the heparinase, we see that uh, in the patients uh, with, uh, with, the, with the severe form, uh, they tend to have uh, a higher uh, activity of uh, heparinase uh, and also a higher production of uh, NATS, which also correlate uh, with the increase of the uh, endothelial glycocalyx uh, degradation marker. And also in, a, in, a, in, in, in these two studies, we also show that uh, there is a tendency of increase of the plasma leakage uh, in the form of uh, serial monitoring from the uh, gallbladder thickening and also ascites or pleural effusion. But indeed, uh, uh, we don't really include uh, the patients with the shock syndrome. <coughs> so what this study can bridge is that uh, the inflammatory process with these different uh, biological mediators uh, underlies 
uh, the the endothelial uh, glycocalyx dysfunction in dengue. But uh, we also mentioned other factors, uh, for instance, uh, with the cardiovascular or also uh, the f uh, the portal vein uh, pressure can can affect the development of shock syndrome and. Uh, those can contribute to the development of uh, the shock syndrome in dengue. Uh, with this understanding, uh, do you think that the host factors plays also a role in the, in the process of the, how the immune is actually activated? Because as you know now, with the uh, continuous uh, uh, infection of dengue in Indonesia, we also deal with the uh, patient with comorbidity with comorbidity and also maybe a patient with the immunocompromised status. Uh, how would you see this will affect the, the, the mechanism and also the risk for the severity of the infection? Uh, indeed, it is true that, uh, uh, that every, every individual, they have a, they have a different uh, response uh, towards infections. And that also what we learn uh, in COVID-19 patients. And uh, in the in the proteomic analysis, uh, when I perform a, a, a clustering analysis, we also show that uh, indeed some patients they have a tendency to have uh, more hyperinflammation, and also in some patients they have a, they have a more, uh, for instance, uh, interferon response. Uh, and then uh, those can be what uh, what can be referred as how the host uh, re reaction can also contribute to the development of pathogenesis. And then the second is, of course, the comorbidities. Uh, it is true that, for instance, in dengue, it has been uh, long known that, uh, for instance, uh, old age, uh, also with other uh, disease comorbidities. And then also second, uh, in, 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 in children, uh, also in adult patients with obesity, and then uh, the other thing is that, uh, especially the highlight in children, is that uh, their vascular response is a bit different from adult. Uh, that's why we rarely see uh, severe cases uh, of dengue in adult patients. So those factors were uh, strongly uh, related with how the, the hosts uh, react to uh, the presence of uh, the pathogen. Can I post one? Yeah, more sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe this is my last question this time. Uh, do you know that uh, in Indonesia now we start to have a dengue vaccine introducing for the, not only children, but also adults. Uh, how would you comment about that uh, in regards of the, uh, whether it will increase the risk because the introducing of the uh, vaccination for the population that might also already exposed to the, the virus beforehand? Yeah. So in response to that, uh, we can, uh, learn from maybe the previous vaccine which is released by Sanofi, the Dengfaxia, which turned out, uh, although it has uh, the four serotypes of dengue and also it kind of introduced uh, the, the children that were vaccinated with, uh, with, uh, with Dengfaxia um, and giving them memory. But turns out uh, there were a, a response of uh, similar response as what uh, be seen in the secondary infections uh, and that uh, can be can be a new uh, insight that uh, we have to really understand how each different uh, epitope of the vaccine which is being used can affect the immune response and as long as i know now uh, there were uh, another vaccine uh, which is uh, released and uh, will be um, implemented in Indonesia, and what my um, what my suggestion is probably first uh, we target uh, uh, on the on the safety of of these patients. We have to uh, monitor whether the the the, the vaccination uh, will induce the similar effect or it will induce more protective effects. And then after that, if we are certain with, uh, with the outcome after the vaccination, we can start uh, probably uh, with uh, those that with a higher exposure, for instance, children and also school age children, and then also adults with, uh, with comorbidities. And uh, if uh, that two groups are covered and we still have enough resources, we can also uh, implement uh, to the nation. But I think, uh, 
uh, assessing the safety uh, of the patients learning from the infoxia will be uh, an important aspect prior to the general use of this vaccine. Uh, by that means you uh, need to test for the serology before the vaccination, you mean? Yeah, uh, so uh, to, to uncertain the, the safety, uh, especially for the, for the children, um, that will be a good uh, suggestion to check probably the, the presence of previous uh, infection uh, in, uh, prior to vaccination. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. And at this point, I would like to thank the members of the Manuscript Committee for their hard work, and which is highly appreciated. We move on uh, with the opposition, first by Professor Joosten. Uh, he's Professor in Mechanisms of Inflammatory Diseases at the Radboud UMC. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Dear candidates, hereby I would like to compliment you with your thesis, and also I want to include your team of supervisors. It's a very interesting topic, uh, exploring what the physiology of dengue and COVID using proteomic neutrophils and platelet function. It was a pleasure to, uh, for me to read it and have new insight in the mechanism of these disease caused by viral infection. My first question, uh, you will not be surprised as with chapter two, that the holding proteomics. And there you use a very nice platform with 300, uh, more than 319 proteins to measure differences between the, the patients in acute versus recovered phase. And I have a question actually about uh, the healthy controls you include. When I see in your table uh, on page 41, I see that only 10 controls. Uh, and but what's also uh, remarkable that these controls were Indonesian, so that's okay. But the blood was drawn in Nijmegen and not in Indonesia. Do you think that could be a potential issue? Dear opponent, uh, in response to that, uh, indeed, we measured uh, a subset of uh, controls, uh, which are Indonesians among Indonesian students uh, here in, in Nijmegen. And the reason for that is, uh, of course, that uh, in the beginning of the study, this trial were, uh, uh, were performed uh, on the patients that were treated and untreated with, uh, with oseltamivir. And then uh, with this addition of controls, uh, what we would like to see is uh, the comparison uh, between uh, the inflammatory proteomes during the acute uh, and, uh, and, and the control uh, in these control patients. And uh, what we did was uh, first to use the acute versus convalescent uh, patients' data as the main um, result of the study. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we kind of uh, do a validation by comparing the acute versus controls, uh, which are enrolled indeed in the Netherlands. But then uh, with this, uh, with this uh, analysis, we also uh, correct for, uh, for instance, the age and also uh, the, the BMI and things. So what I can assume that uh, using the primary data from the acute versus convalescence, uh, is the primary uh, findings of yep. the study, and then we use that as a comparison. I agree on that because we know from holding is so sensitive technology that you even yep. can make difference between the site where you draw blood. Also, here in the Netherlands, you see differences, so you have to be very mm. careful that the controls would actually also come from the same site, same university or hospital in Indonesia. Yep. But indeed, the main findings are between the patients, eh? between acute and the recovery phase. And of course, uh, when you look at figure one eh, in your chapter, as a research, you look at all the proteins to see if you can find your favorite, see which side the kinds. And since I'm working many years on R32, I said, oh yes, my, my favorite is there. What do yeah. you know about R32 in general? Yeah. Uh, so in response to that, uh, in, in IL-32 has been known uh, for their uh, pro-inflammatory effects. Uh, and especially their function has been long known uh, for the activity of the natural killer cell. And then there were some uh, subsets, or we can also say uh, uh, the subtype of this IL-32. And indeed, uh, in this study, what we show is that uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the IL-32 were actually downregulated during the acute phase which means it's much more uh, upregulated uh, during the convalescent phase. And then in response to that, uh, it is well possible that the, the 
the anti-inflammatory subtype of the IL-32 uh, takes lead uh, more rather than the pro-inflammation, uh, especially during the acute phase. And that's why they were much more uh, enhanced during the convalescent phase. And, and do you know which isoform, eh? because IL-32 have four isoforms, mm. that is detected in the O-link? Have you any idea? Uh, which, which in, this, in this analysis, we... we uh, uh, we we get the the IL thirty two, but if I have to speculate, it might be the IL thirty two, the alpha yeah. subtype. In which I think the also uh, what we of course ask what is the alpha, which mm -hmm. is anti inflammatory, mm -hmm. so that fits in the scene down regulation. Yeah, but also maybe explain that the difference in scene figure D when mm -hmm. you look at the genes when the genes mm -hmm. that from this uh, and link with the protein, and there she acts in opposite. You see an up regulation in there. Yeah. So it could be that the genes attack all isoforms mm -hmm. of R32 and the O-link only one isoform. And that's why you see the difference between figure C and figure mm. D. Yeah. And that could be an explanation. Yeah. But that's uh, yeah, it's very nice to see that uh, because this uh, cytokine, or actually it is an in, 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 uh, in transcription effect, is also highly expressed in endothelium, which is also relevant for your study. Mm. And also linked to uh, damage, cell damage, apoptosis. So therefore, probably it's also released. But then, of course, I looked to, to in proteins that were really strongly <laughs> upregulated, and I found uh, many uh, enzymes, for example, gramzyme A and B. And these are serine proteins, as you really described in, in, in your, in your uh, uh, chapter. Um, of course, these are uh, uh, serine proteases. And there are also other class of CM proteases active uh, during, let's say, cell stimulation and also net formation. Do you have any idea which other serine proteases are released by cell activation, like neutrophils? Yeah, uh, honor. So uh, in this uh, analysis, uh, what we show that the, the serine proteins that associated uh, with acute phase uh, of the inflammation in the, uh, the grand enzymes. But also uh, in uh, literatures and previous study, uh, of course, uh, we also see a lot of uh, activation of the coagulation markers. And for instance, the thrombin generation and thrombin is, uh, is one of the serine proteins were also upregulated. And then as well, uh, as we see uh, in, 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 in chapter three and also in, in chapter four that uh, hepernase and also uh, the neutrophil extracellular trap are closely related uh, with, for instance, uh, the other uh, serine proteins such as catapsins, which are released by the neutrophils. And also, uh, catapsins also activate uh, hepernase. Uh, the pro hepernase were activated by the catapsins. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what can be the possible? Uh, explanation is that uh, quite a lot of uh, serine proteins uh, were regulated during the inflammatory response uh, in danger. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. because it, do we have time? One? No. Oh. Oh, unfortunately not. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we discuss afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution, Professor Joosten. We move on to Dr. Verhagen. She is pediatrician and assistant professor at the Radboud UMC. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rector. Uh, I also want to congratulate you and the supervising theme on a very nice thesis and also performing this in a different country uh, with different cultures and navigating these challenges uh, uh, is, I think, an accomplishment in itself that will definitely uh, help you in the rest of your career, wherever you'll go. Um, my questions are around the pathophysiology of thrombocytopenia observed in dengue. <laughs> And uh, I see that we share at least two common interests. Platelets are a key subject in your thesis, and as you rightfully so mentioned, children are at risk of uh, severe dengue. Uh, and also coming from a clinical background like yourself, it has always fascinated me that we have so many platelets. Um, each day, 100 billion platelets are produced and cleared from our blood to maintain this number of platelets at 150 to 45 billion per liter. As a clinician, when you teach junior doctors, how do you explain to them that we have so many platelets? What do you tell them about their primary function? Dear opening, so as uh, previously I uh, demonstrated also in the presentation that uh, platelet has uh, so many functions. Uh, for instance, their main function is of course to maintain the vascular integrity 
which is in the form that to perform the primary hemostasis and also to uh, preserve the endothelial leakage. And then also uh, the other thing is that uh, as recently, sh is recently shown that they also have immunomodulatory properties uh, and also to uh, they can also known to directly uh, interact with the pathogens. They can even uh, has been shown ex vivo to phagocytize, for instance, influenza virus. So why we have uh, more platelets, uh, the possible explanation and the things that we can tell the medical students is that they have way more uh, function rather than just to uh, create the blood clock. So they also have this host defense function and that's also important. Uh, and that's why their number is not, uh, it's not uh, less and, and yep. also, that's I completely agree with you, and I'm happy to see that you're already integrating your research findings into your clinical teaching, uh, because indeed they must have additional functions, and that's probably why we have so many. Um, and then another question, in light of your thesis um, and the role of platelets in the antiviral immune response, do you think the platelets here are the victim or the effector cell of this immune response? So in response to that, uh, I would say that uh, rather than a victim, uh, they were at actively uh, participate in the host defense. As, we, as what we can see here, uh, for instance, it, uh, I think it's very clear in the, in, the, in the COVID paper that they were hyperactivated, which means they were directly uh, also involved uh, in, the mac uh, in the pathogenesis of uh, the throm thrombotic complications in COVID-19 patients. And also uh, in dengue, for instance, with the heparinase uh, activity that we shown that although we do not directly show that uh, the the increased heparinase were coming uh, from platelet in the in, in in dengue patients, but we show that platelets store quite a lot of uh, heparinase uh, in their lysosome, and that might also. Uh, directly implicate to when they were actively uh, secreting their uh, granules uh, and also their lysosome, they actively participate uh, in the host defense. Yeah, uh, so you, you may think it's both. They're a little bit of a victim and they're also definitely an effector cell, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that. Uh, I guess the underlying question is also why do we see this thrombocytopenia? in dengue patients, which is a, yeah, a, a typical characteristic, right? Um, and in some parts of your thesis, it seems as if uh, you link this thrombocytopenia to platelet activation. For example, if we go to chapter three, um, which is one of the chapters where you describe that link, and uh, specifically in page 94, in figure 2a, um, you show that there's a negative correlation between the platelet number and the net, so the neutrophil extracellular CHEP uh, formation, right? Yes. Um, and this negative correlation is mostly there uh, from day 7 to 13, correct? Yes. Now, as you showed in your initial presentation, the thrombocytopenia is usually there way earlier, right? Yeah. So I was just wondering if, thrombocyte if the thrombocytopenia is driven by this platelet activation, uh, there seems to be a bit of a discrepancy of when these platelets are activated, at least from, for this function, and when the thrombocytopenia actually occurs. How would you explain that? So, uh, in response to this, uh, in relation with the platelet activation, we do see, uh, already see the, the platelet activations around day three uh, ahead uh, after, since the fever onset. And then uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, these platelet activations uh, were persist until even day, uh, more, uh, day 13, uh, day 7 to day 13, so they were still uh, activated. And then our explanation uh, why we only see uh, the, the correlation with the, with the net formations on day, uh, day, seven, uh, day, day, day 13 to day 13 uh, ahead is that it's possible that during the during the inflammatory process uh, on the febrile and critical phase, which is day one to three and also day four to six, uh, the, there is a major distortion in the in the blood uh, in the blood uh, circulation, and also the fact that especially during the during the critical phase, uh, some of the some of uh, the 
the proteins will leak and it can affect uh, the interaction uh, between what's what's actually in the in the circulation and also uh, what's uh, what's the inflammatory response occurring in the circulation and that's why uh, on on day on day seven onwards uh, what we see here is that uh, the leakage uh, started to res to be reabsorbed and that's why we started to see the negative correlation because we see a consistent negative correlation here with the platelet number and also platelet uh, activation marker and also with the von Willebrand factor binding on the platelets. So they are actually activated early is what you say, yeah. right? Yes, okay, I agree. And uh, then I give the floor back to the director. Thank you so much. Um, the next opponent is Dr. Kosashi. He's senior researcher at the INA Respond in Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm also pleased that you traveled here to Nijmegen. Welcome yeah. at our university. The floor is yours. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Rector. So, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Fadel and also the promoter and the co-promoter for completing this study and for writing such an important book. Yeah. I really enjoy it and I learn a lot uh, from your impressive book. Thank you. Uh, I have a question actually related to the question that uh, is asked by uh, Prof. Uh, Ernie. Yeah. Uh, it's about the uh, primary and secondary infection in Chapter 2 and Chapter 4. Yeah. I uh, was quite surprised to read that uh, your finding uh, is like the, the secondary infection is only like half of uh, the subject. Yeah. Uh, as we know uh, from previous study uh, that the secondary infection, especially in an hyperendemic area like Semarang and Bandung, are very high. And your subjects are mostly adult. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would like you to comment on this, yeah, because it is a very significant difference than the previous subject at uh, the previous study. And also, as we know, like the seroprevalence yeah, of the IgG uh, in children uh, and six until nine years old, uh, it's almost 90%. So uh, that's why it, is, uh, it was quite surprising for me. Yep. Dear opponent, so in response to that, that uh, indeed uh, what, what uh, we found uh, that in this study were most of the patients even uh, were more uh, primary uh, infection. And that's uh, indeed uh, were because uh, I think there were some, uh, especially for the, for the subset classification that we use in this study. So uh, in, in, in chapter two there, uh, especially in the part uh, where we show uh, the associations with, uh, with, the, with the clinical uh, parameters here, is that uh, what we use here is that uh, the so for the primary dengue is those that were positive for the NS1 and then indeed for the secondary infection here what we show uh, is from the uh, IgM or IgG so uh, it is well possible that uh, this is uh, what underlies uh, the number of the of the of the secondary of the low secondary cases uh, observed uh, in this study um, do you know like what method that you use to detect? Because usually we consider primary or secondary infection is based on the IgG. Yeah. So uh, what kind of method that do you use uh, for uh, testing the IgG? Yeah, so uh, indeed in this, uh, in this study that uh, we classify the primary and secondary based on uh, the, 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 the rapid uh, IgG assay. And uh, for for that, uh, I think it was mentioned in the uh, in, in in our chapter two that uh, we have the the probable uh, secondary infections yeah. uh, in the subjects. Yeah, that's what uh, I think I'm worried about, especially when you try to make a correlation uh, by subcategorizing it into primary and secondary infection. Yeah, uh, because I think uh, the rapid test is designed to detect the IgG at the high level. Eh? So uh, by using the IgG, I think you will uh, underestimate secondary infection. Yeah. Sure. So uh, my suggestion is I think you still have the specimen maybe 
to like repeat it using the IgG ELISA. Yeah? So that maybe later you can analyze it better. I don't know if maybe because of that you can make like a better correlation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the suggestion. That will be uh, an interesting uh, next uh, analysis for this. If you have no further questions, you're welcome to. No? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your contribution. Then we'll move on to the last opponent, which is Professor de Groot. He's Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Utrecht. Also welcome at our university. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to, congr so all, I want to congratulate you with your thesis, and I also want to congratulate your promotion committee with this very nice booklet. Um, I want to continue first a little bit on the platelets, uh, especially platelets in correlation with COVID-19. There you show that in COVID-19, platelets are reacting sm sm faster and that the content of ATP in the dense granules is lower. And you correlate that with thrombotic complications. Uh, we know from the clinic that Patient, some patients do have low contents of ATP in their dense granules. We call that storage pool disease, and these patients bleed. And these, some of them bleed severely. How do you correlate lower ATP in platelets with thrombotic complications instead of bleeding? Yeah. Dear Alpanin, in response to that, uh, first that uh, what we did here were uh, after measuring the hyper-responsiveness and also the, the granule release capacity. So we use both of the parameters uh, that uh, indirectly showing that uh, the platelet were indeed a bit more hyperreactive uh, with a reduced uh, uh, ATP release. But then uh, when it comes uh, to, the, to the associations with the, with the thrombotic complications, what we also use here were uh, one marker of uh, uh, thrombotic uh, complication, which is the dimer, and also two markers of uh, inflammation, which is CRP, which are CRP and uh, need the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. And it, indeed, uh, what uh, we see here is that the strongest associations uh, also uh, were more stronger in the, uh, in the, in the hyper responsiveness. Uh, with the dimer and also CRP and in NLR, and in relation uh, with the with the granule release capacity, is what we interpret is that uh, because in the subset of patients that have the bleeding, it might be because they have uh, lower production and lower storage of the ATP itself. But what we see here in this COVID patient is first they have hyperactivation uh, of the platelets that leads to the lower uh, ATP secretion. So the lower ATP secretion were much more because of the, their uh, hyperactive phenotype. Uh, red, uh, and that's why uh, we rarely see in uh, bleeding phenotype in, in, co in the severe COVID-19 patients. <clears throat> yeah, you, you say that it is hyperreactivity uh, of the platelets, but what do you consider as hyperreactivity of platelets? That they react a little bit faster? Is that hyperreactivity? I would always think hyperreactivity is when they act on much lower concentrations of activator. That is hyperreactivity. That is reacted so sooner because the, the, there's a lower concentration of activator. What do you think is more important? lower concentrations of activator of the fastness that they respond on a high concentration of activator. So uh, what I think, uh, because in, 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 in our essay we also include uh, a small amount of uh, platelet activator and that's also what uh, reflects with the results that uh, the patients with the severe one they have uh, more, uh, they have a uh, an increase of hyperactivation, but then what's the, what might be important is that because uh, especially in infectious disease there there are uh, not only inflammation but also activations uh, of the coagulation system, and of course uh, one of the mechanism is for instance through thrombin generation, and if the platelet were hyperreactive uh, hip hyperreactive uh, with a small amount of uh, of uh, of a platelet activator, for instance, if they were exposed to this uh, to this uh, activation, uh, for instance, thrombin, they were 
becoming more uh, more rapidly activated and also this can uh, indirectly implicate to the complication for instance in, in infectious diseases okay you, you did not make a dose response curve on the uh, indeed, in this study, we did not uh, create a dose response, so we use uh, a single. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Splitter. Then I have an, another thing. What, uh, what I found interesting to see that you suggest that heparinase activity, which is apparently also released from the platelets, is plays an important role in the leakage of, of, of blood for, uh, to the vessel, and you suggest an inhibitor of heparinase would help. But what kind of inhibitor do you think? What is the natural inhibitor of heparinase in, in your blood? So uh, there were some uh, natural inhibitors uh, uh, heparinase uh, in the blood. Uh, for instance, I think uh, the heparin sulfate itself uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, is a known uh, as uh, the target of this heparinase. And then of course what we have seen in the clinic is uh, with the heparins, uh, and uh, there were an old study that uh, describing that heparin can uh, inhibit, uh, heparin can increase the platelet uh, number uh, in dengue patient. It was a very old study. But of course, uh, what uh, we want uh, is to have a, a heparin inhibitor, which is not uh, having a attend uh, uh, anticoagulant uh, properties. Yeah, I was also thinking of, he <coughs> of heparin, and there are heparins nowadays that do not influence coagulation. So I think that would be a very nice uh, try to see whether you can inhibit that. Um, another thing about the uh, release of he um, heparinase, if you see of leakage of uh, plasma from your vessels, then you immediately think, is there a genetic model that mimics this? And yes, there is. You have patients with angioedema who s have a, a, a strong leakage of, uh, of, of plasma from, from the vessels. And we know what causes that, that C1 inhibitor mutations. Uh, C1 inhibitor is one of the important inhibitors, factor 12, and also mutations factor 12 give leakage because they can release bradykinin for high molecular kininogen mm -hmm. and that activates endothelial cells and uh, opens up the tight junctions. Is there any information about this system in dengue? Yeah. Because that is what we know absolutely important. Uh, in response to that, uh, previous study indeed have explored the role of uh, the coagulation system in dengue. And what's interesting here uh, is that uh, there is uh, actually a more tendency of bleeding uh, as what uh, have been seen uh, in dengue. So there is uh, kind of an increase uh, of the activation of uh, this coagulation factor, but in, 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 in a more... I, I do not consider factor 12 as a coagulation factor. There are activators of factor 12 that do not influence coagulations, but do release bradykinin. Yeah. Uh, in response to that, uh, as long as I know that uh, direct measurement of uh, bradykinin uh, has never been performed previously, and of course, uh, indeed, that will be uh, an interesting uh, thing to explore uh, in the in the near future of the study. <coughs> of okay. And another thing is that we know uh, already for a long time that and one of the roles of platelets is to maintain the integrity of endothelial cells. That has been published already for a long time and we have identified a number of components who are involved in this maintenance. For example, VEGF. What happens in dengue, in, in dengue with these components? Something released from the endothelial cells, also apparently the, the, the good things, and apparently it goes wrong. What happens? Yeah. So what we see is that there is an increase of VGF in dengue patients. Okay. okay, thank you. The defense is hereby concluded. I give the floor once again to the PhD candidate. Having defended my dissertation to the best of my ability, I would like to thank the director and my supervisors and co-supervisor, as well as those who have honored this ceremony with their presence. The Doctoral Examination Board retreats for its deliberations.
On behalf of the doctorate board of the Rappert University Nijmegen, we have decided to award you the degree of doctor. I invite Professor van der Ven to discharge the task assigned to him. With the power entrusted by law to the doctoral board, I hereby confer upon you Fadel Mohamed Garisha, born in Tegel, the doctor, the title of doctor from Radboud University in Nijmegen, to which are attached all the associated legal and customary rights and duties with respect to academia and society. As a proof thereof, I present you with the doctoral diploma signed by the rector and the doctoral thesis supervisor and co-supervisor. Please be seated. The laudatio will be spoken by the co-promoter, Dr. De Mast. Dear Dr. Garisha, dear Fadel, um, I'm delighted that I can congratulate you with your successful defense. Uh, you did it. Um, and what a remarkable morning it, it is. Um, and I think you can be very proud of, uh, of what you've accomplished. Um, you've written a very nice thesis, which you defended very well in the presence of numerous colleagues here from Nijmegen, but also from Indonesia. Um, let's, I would like to take a moment to look a bit back, like how did this journey start? your PhD in Nijmegen. Um, you started as a study doctor in a dengue study in Samara. The study was coordinated by Ajeng, Tunjung Putri. Um, and in this study, you tested this, yeah, this idea we had that the decrease in platelets is caused by the loss of sialic acids. Um, and, and by the way, uh, it, it a study which is in the thesis of, uh, of Sylvita, who will defend after, your, after the end of this ceremony. Um, and I remember very well that both Ajeng and Professor Gassem, who was always an excellent yeah, nose for spotting talent, and they said, like, we think Fadel would be an excellent candidate for a PhD in Nijmegen, kind of as a successor to Ajeng, who was finishing her PhD at that time. So you applied for a prestigious LPDP grant from the Indonesian government. Um, that was quite a rigorous selection process. Uh, I know you even had to undergo a psychological test, whether you would be psychologically fit to come over to Nijmegen. Well, fortunately, <laughs> you were. And um, so in the end, you, you arrived here in Nijmegen in the spring of 2018. And uh, the idea was that your PhD would focus on the role of platelet sialic acid in infectious diseases. And dengue, but Prof. Gassam is also an expert on leptospirosis. So that was the idea. So at that <coughs> time you started in the lab working on, on platelets and you quickly discovered that platelets are quite yeah, complex cells, or cell fragments, that's the word in common. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're quite difficult cells to work with in the lab. And you also experience that research can also be sometimes quite frustrating and, and <laughs> requires persistence. Well, fortunately, you showed over the past years that you have what it requires to be a good researcher, and you have showed really good persistence. Um, at that time, we also started a collaboration with Professor Johan van der Vlag, who is in the audience, um, and his group, so Niels and uh, Boranka. And I think here things also came really nice together. So Professor van der Vlag is in, uh, is, has been working on glycocalyx, on heparinase and ethelium in renal diseases and autoimmune diseases for many years. And um, yeah, as you've shown this morning, 
these processes are also highly relevant in dengue. And um, yeah, I think we, we gained some very nice first results on, for example, heparinase. And this really, yeah, ask for follow-up research. I'm really convinced that your studies have been a very nice starting point for this. Um, what you also showed during your studies, and, and I think we've all, we've all witnessed that, that you are, you are, I think you're almost an artist. You make beautiful figures. <laughs> and um, uh, I've never had, like, with your, with your, when you first had your first version of your talk, it were only figures. I said, yeah, for now, put a, put a bit of text here and there. Uh, <laughs> and I would like to invite everyone also um, to look at, at, at the front cover and also the explanation of the figure, um, <laughs> which is shown on your front cover. And, uh, hey, and you, where you explain about, uh, I probably mispronounced, the Gunungan? Uh, Gunungan. Gunungan. Um, <laughs> and, and, and where you also describe, and that's where I really recognize you, about the harmony between the cells and the vascular responses. And you are just a very harmonious uh, person, I would say. So beautiful <laughs> figures. So you were really gaining momentum uh, in, your, in, your, in your research, while, as you already mentioned, suddenly there was this other virus, early 2020. And I was, um, it was quite a surreal situation. I was, yesterday evening, I was reading back those emails of March 2020. <laughs> Like, yeah, what, what to do? Do you need to go back to Indonesia? Or, or uh, then I said, well, probably, uh, I, I think I emailed, it will probably last a few weeks. Um, so you can also maybe stay here. Well, fortunately, you managed to return to, uh, to Sumara just before the, 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 the air travel became impossible. So in this, this situation, of course, it, it affected your, your PhD. Your work here in Nijmegen was, was interrupted, uh, the lab work. And, 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 but you also arranged everything for, for a study in, in dengue patients eh, with, with platelet uh, function in, uh, in Sumaran. Uh, but here again, you showed great flexibility and you conducted an, uh, a nice study on, uh, on COVID instead, on the, but on the quite yeah, difficult circumstances, I would say. So overall, in the past uh, years, we've come to know you as a, yeah, as a devoted and persistent uh, researcher who has the flexibility to adapt, um, which I think is very important in, uh, in science. I can only yeah, imagine how challenging it must be to be yeah, away from your wife and from your, from your family and your friends for all these years, for such an extended period. And therefore, I would also like to congratulate you and your parents and all the colleagues from Indonesia um, yeah, with, with your successful PhD. Um, and without their support, this would have been probably very difficult. Um, you're also part of a long tradition of collaboration between Diponegoro University and Dr. Cariadi Hospital and Radboud UMC. Um, Prof. Kassem, who is an alumnus of Radboud University himself, you just explained to me 2001 was your uh, PhD. <laughs> Um, he has always been a driving force behind this collaboration together with uh, Professor Sultana, who is in the audience, and we're also very happy that Professor Dolmans is also in the audience because he's also uh, has always been an important driving force here. Um, yeah, and, and I think I'll also talk on behalf of Andre that we would like to thank you for, um, yeah, for, for that mentorship of many of the students that we have jointly supervised over the years. I would also like to thank the members of the manuscript committee um, for their work and also the colleagues who are here today for the, for the opposition. Fidel, um, now you started your training as a, for, for, to become an internist. Yeah. Um, excellent choice, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I'm convinced you will have a very nice career in front of you. And I hope that some of the skills that you learned during your PhD here are also very useful uh, as an internist. Uh, uh, being critical, um, but also being curious. 
Uh, our work as interns is just being curious and always ask the why question. Hey, you see this patient with strange uh, symptoms and why? And, and then, oh, is it dengue? Then why, why do this patient has these complications? And, and you've experienced here in Nijmegen that our laboratory, uh, headed by Leo, is an integral part of, the, of our department with very strong links between the, the lab and, and, and the ward uh, well, and, and patient care. And yeah, we still hardly know anything about the real pathophysiology of dengue. So there's a lot of work to be done. So you think now I'm done. No, you're not done. <laughs> As you're an internist in Indonesia. Um, so uh, yeah, it would be great if you could uh, keep on working on these, uh, on these topics. Um, know that you're always welcome here in Nijmegen. And um, I, I wish you all the best in your uh, future endeavors. And then I will end with my only two words in Bahasa that I know, namely, Terima Kasi. Thank you. Terima Kasi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I too would like to congratulate you warmly, very warmly, also on behalf of the doctorate board of our university with obtaining the PhD degree today. Um, and of course, I would also like to include with the congratulations, your family members, your colleagues, and your friends. And a special congratulations to your wife. You can really relax now. <laughs> he did a great job because we all could witness how he very well defended his thesis. Dr. Karisha, I wish you uh, every success in your future career, first as resident and later on as specialist, and above most importantly, all happiness in your life with your family. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We have now come to the conclusion of this ceremony, and I will ask you to all stand up. We close this ceremony with the following words. Gratias tibi agimus omnipotens pro omnibus beneficius tuis, qui vivis regnas per omnia secula seculorum. <laughs>